So I don't know if most of you have heard of transcriptional bursting. Um, it's actually gene expression is not constant. The gene is not on all the time producing mRNA. Uh, transcription occurs in bursts. So this is uh, a study with an artificial system where they have a reporter of the protein with fluorescence and also measure the mRNAs. So you can imagine here that a gene gets turned on. That means recruiting like transcription factor and recruiting the whole uh, transcriptional machinery. It often forms sort of this transcriptional loop. So once you have the machinery there, you can actually produce a lot of copies of mRNA and then for different reason it falls off. So basically here we have a time where it's on, you get a spike in mRNA production and then of course depending on the degradation rate of that mRNA and so on, uh, it starts going down and then it comes on again and then goes down. And the protein, of course, will get start uh, getting translated once we have the mRNA and it's transported out of the nuclei. So then you get a peak of protein like this. Often the protein has longer half-life and that might become completely flat for, other, uh, for most other proteins. But you can actually detect these kind of fluctuations also in protein levels in single cells but it's much stronger signal for the mRNA. So if you look at, here is just a time course with these small spikes here is when the gene is getting turned on. Sometimes you might have two spikes very close to each other and you get an accumulation with a lot of mRNA that gets degraded. But then it's some space here where there's no not a, any spike in a long time and it's completely depleted of mRNA. And what you have to think about is that when we do single cell RNA-seq and we sequence a population, one might be here and one might be here. So even though we have very different levels of this mRNA between two cells, they might actually be the same cell type. And this is a stochastic process. So if we have a whole population of cells, we wouldn't assume all genes to be spiking at the same time. So we, the ensemble of expression of all mRNAs should still give the same signal of a cell type signature. But if you have a highly expressed mRNA in one, in most cells of your cell population, but not in all of them, you shouldn't be worried because that's the nature of transcription. That it can happen that we just, some of the cells we sample that's at these time points where the mRNA is just not expressed. Of course, then we have two copies of uh, the chromosomes. So we might, so you will have bursting from both alleles at different times. And also, this clearly follows uh, gene expression uh, levels. So a highly expressed gene will burst more frequently, will produce more mRNA per burst, and you will never reach these zero levels of that mRNA. But a lowly expressed gene, you always have this kind of salt and pepper pattern where most cells do not have it, but a few cells here and there have uh, the gene detected. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of <laughs> projects have been involved in people want to study transcription factors, and a lot of those are lowly expressed and have these kind of very spiky expression pattern. And a lot of researchers are really surprised that why don't we see this transcription factor in all the cells of this cell type, since it's a like hallmark regulator for the cell type. And that's just the nature of transcription. And then, of course, here is just an illustration. So basically, even though we have here one cell type where these four genes should be expressed, we might have just bursting of these two in this cell. This one, we detect all of them and so on. Then 
we dissociate the cells, we might introduce some bias here also that depending on what state the cell is in, they might uh, dissociate better or worse. So we end up with a sample here of two cells in this illustration. Then we do reverse transcription. And there we also lose a lot of the transcripts because even though we have many copies of the mRNAs, once we convert them to cDNA, this is the very limiting step where we lose, depending on the method, it could be 10 to 40, I don't know, with SmartSec3, they claim it's probably even higher than 40% of them that we can detect. So this is what we call dropouts. Now we can't really distinguish between when we don't detect it due to uh, transcriptional bursting and we, we can't detect it due to just dropout in this uh, reverse transcription step. And then of course, once we have our cDNA here, we want to amplify it. And here, there might also be a bias uh, that some uh, transcripts are more easy to amplify than others, like the length of them, the, sp the structure, GC content and so on. So there, there will be a bias there. If you instead do bulk RNA-seq, you get perfect proportions or perfect, it's not even, it's not perfect either, but better estimate of the proportions of the different genes. And it's good to be aware of that the levels we detect, uh, if you compare it to bulk RNA-seq without amplification, even though we have uh, the UMIs, we can control for this bias, but also this step is not perfectly unbiased. So there might be differences between a bulk RNA-seq and when you take all your single cell RNA-seq. But if it's completely random, shouldn't they be the same? What are the cell populations that are more sensitive to the random selection or? Uh, you mean here in reverse transcription? Yeah, I think this should be fairly random across all cells. But it's not random if you compare it to an unamplified bulk. Uh, or, or a bulk that's not been doing, uh, been done in the exact same uh, library prep method. But I think the biggest bias is in the amplification step. But it feels like this step uh, as long as you're comparing within your cells that was done with the same library prep method, it should be fine. Hopefully. But I can't really answer the question if it, if it is uh, re completely random or not. Uh, there, I mean, of course, there are some, some bias that some bind to the uh, oligo bet better. There might be differences in poly A length and so on that uh, influences what we can uh, detect. And uh, for those that work with uh, bulk RNA-seq, you will realize that there are a lot of additional problems when you start with single cell RNA-seq. As I mentioned, we have these amplification bias and dropout rates and transcription bursting. So when you compare two cells of the same cell type, it normally looks something like this. The highly expressed genes are often highly expressed in both cells, but you always have a lot of genes that are detected in one cell, but not the other one, like these on the side. And you have a lot of uh, dispersion, you might have outliers that were detected in only one of them. Uh, there might be some background noise, there might be bias due to cell cycle, size of the cells and so on, and we quite often have uh, clear batch effects in uh, single cell RNA-seq. Uh, 